You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Sego sabuguego. Hello. My name is Lisa Webster. I'm a Ganageha Lenape woman living on the island settlerly known as Gabriola within Sinemuk territory. Today I am volunteering with Gabriola Media to bring you some information about a program or a series, a learning series that I think everyone on Gabriola should at least take a look into once or twice. And this is online. It is the Learning with Seatsias. It is the response to TRC 57 by the uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith Public School, um, Dis School District 68, I believe. And it is, it is a video series of um, authors and thought leaders, usually Indigenous, um, but not always, uh, individuals who come forward and just talk about what their research has been or what their books are about and really gives you a really good idea of uh, how um, some of the Indigenous topics can be uh, spoken about, thought about, um, and just really good for increasing your knowledge of Indigenous peoples uh, in British Columbia and in particular on Vancouver Island. I love this series. I have promoted it for as many people as I can. I just think it's a good jumping off point into uh, greater learning and greater knowing um, about um, it, the issues that are affecting uh, Indigenous uh, peoples in British Columbia, Indigenous peoples within Canada, and um, really helping to provide a different perspective. The episode that I would like to recommend for you today um, is uh, in season two, um, the episode is uh, entitled To Share Not Surrender, Indigenous and Settler Visions of Treaty Making in the Colonies of Vancouver Island and British Columbia. And I'm recommending this particular video because this is a book that is being presented that is edited by quite a number of people. In the uh, uh, actual show, you'll see two of the authors, Peter Cook and Neil Valance. And they are, um, Peter Cook is an Associate Professor of History at uh, University of, of Victoria. And Neil Valance is an Adjunct Professor at Law at the University of, of Victoria. And they're providing a lot of um, ethno-historical research on the Vancouver Island treaties. Many people don't know that Vancouver Island, and in particular Sinemuk, have treaties called the Douglas Treaties. Um, really important that we understand and know what those treaties are, how they were made, what they were intended to do, and what the perspectives are from both the settler point of view, the government point of view, but also from, from the um, First Nation point of view, and in our case on Gabriola, Sinemuk. If you had been at the um, Gabriola Arts Council presentation, uh, Breaking Bannock, Building Bridges, uh, guest um, counselor Bill Yoakum from Sinemuk mentioned and talked a lot about how the nation is really wanting to ensure that the rights that are protected under that treaty um, will be enacted and implemented. And so this particular um, uh, episode will give you a lot of that detail. And in particular, at the end of the um, author speaking, you'll have, um, I believe there's a half an hour of Chief Doug White III from Sinemuk speaking directly about the Sinemuk point of view on the Douglas Treaties. And this is um, really a must watch and something for you to consider and learn a little bit more about um, as we proceed um, through the years and into the future. So enjoy. Now I swell much sweat. Hi, it's Epka Kwasi Alep Hwainamit. Welcoming everyone to the TRC 57 speaker series. It's a, a learning with CIA. It's a 
uh, part of uh, Nanaimo Lady Smith Public Schools, uh, learning how to come together and walk in a different way as we begin to understand uh, how the Coast Salish have lived in this sacred area of the world since the beginning of time. Aitzayapka. Anta tam kwatan Lawrence tanashkwanita mafnesne. And I am a Snownawis relative walking with the school district to help host this speaker series because our dear relative Teddy Cadwallader is un unavailable to be here. But uh, we have our dear relative Squitha Tanat as well as our three CM Shkwalakwa joining us to share on some important dialogue uh, to help us understand and gain some valuable knowledge on, on the treaties. Um, right now, I would like to open up with a prayer and share a song. Hai Tsepka. Haichka tzitzish cm haichka. Haichka ata hai al aik squail. Haichka snitz hali. Haichka ata ha ha tamach. Haichka ata cm shwalakwa. Tihwam amastal ata aik shwalawan atanakwail. Tihwam tzitzu atahut el eatna shwalakwa. Di quam 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 stuch de squalowans to el eat a swalaqua, tartle to the matsi eyes at an aquail. Di quam lot lamethet sep at the sulquen e swavali e smanamst. Ti weet an qua kikulis mustimuch. Di quam flachen to salawa mustimuch. Ti weet an qua kaki mustimuch. Ti quam slash a can stuch than a twamach. Aitka quats twa e a tana tamach, the tana quail, e to mock squail. Nawa squam quums than a tilly seeds at CM Aitka Aitka.
Tepka, CM Schwalakwa, Atanaquel, Nastlikunis Zayet Namet Stucht, LE Schwalakwa, Titzel Namet Atanaquel, Hi Tepka. We really want to acknowledge and thank each and every one of you for managing to get here today. We would really like to honor and acknowledge our Snutnawis relatives, our Snutni Much Schwalakwa and our students Shwalakwa for all of the, the beautiful work that is taking place in the school district and the lands that our schools are situated upon. We would like to also um, UBC Press and Kerry Kilmartin who have joined with us in this journey and brought forward some amazing and beautiful people to help us as we journey through this uh, great understanding and learning that has been brought upon this district. Uh, we'd also like to share that if you go to um, trc57speakerseries.ca, you will be able to view the, the previous speakers and the presentations that, we've, that have taken place. And you could also uh, purchase the books that, are, that have, um, each one of our presenters have written books and those books are available. And if you're able to use a they're giving us a 20% discount for anybody that um, would like to purchase those books. Uh, today, Nanu Tsayish Tanashkwalwan, really honorable and um, gratitude in my feelings for the, our relatives that have joined us here today to speak about the Vancouver Island treaties and to help us understand the broader context of what the uh, early indigenous settler treaties uh, were all about and how it came to be in our, our uh, um, today's world called Canada. We have our dear relative Peter Cook, also Neil Valance, and our CM Colossalton, and I believe somebody else just joined us. Is that Graham? Graham Brazier? Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so um, Peter Cook has joined us from the Department of History at the University of Victoria in 2010, and his key focus is research and writing about the history of Indigenous settler relations in Eastern North America before 1850. He has a very particular focus on alliances and treaty making. And we are truly humbled to have you join us here today, my relative and our dear relative, Neil Valance. Uh, although retired, he's had a long standing career in property law in Victoria. And in 2016, he obtained his PhD from the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria with a focus on the formation of the Douglas Treaties from 1850 to 1854. He is currently engaged in the ethno-historical research on Vancouver Island treaty claims and occasionally teaches property law at the University of Victoria. And our dear relative C.M. Quilosselton is a practicing lawyer who was called to the bar in 2008. He's been a, a remarkable individual that is advancing uh, the rights and the, the plight of our people for all across Canada. Uh, he's the co-chair of the 
BC Provincial Advisory Committee for Indigenous and Specialized Courts and Related Initiatives, the Chair of the BC First Nations Justice Council, and the Director of the Nanaimo Port Authority. He's also been the HEWAC and uh, on Council of the Nanaimo First Nation. Uh, there are so many good things to share about our dear relative Kualasultan, and uh, we are just touched in a really good place that you guys could all join us and we look forward to anything and everything that you can share with us to help us open up our minds and hearts on the historical um the history of what has been going on in this area of the world um, we're, we're really humbled to be here and we thank each and every one of you for coming forward i'm sorry i don't know about graham brazier i'm sorry bro I'm happy to introduce uh, Graham to the to the group. Um, Graham is one of the co-editors, the five one of the five co-editors of the book, and he is. Thank you. Yes, Stephanie's showing us the cover there. Um, to share, not surrender. Uh, Graham is no stranger to uh, editing. He previously edited a, a co collection of papers on uh, the islands, history of the islands of British Columbia. And he is. I certainly know him best for uh, his work in editing and transcribing a truly valuable historical document, the Fort Victoria Journal, uh, which covers the uh, years 1846 to 1850. Um, and as an independent scholar on Denman Island, um, uh, Graham is, is, is sort of interested in all things about the human history of the, of the Salish Sea. And uh, his particular expertise in this volume is uh, shedding light on uh, sort of what Douglas was and doing and thinking uh, up until the moment he began uh, 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 treaty making uh, on the island. And so um, I, uh, Graham uh, is, is available for the question and answer period where if anybody has specific questions about, about that period and about that, that, th those issues, um, uh, he's happy to, to, to chime in. Thank you, Peter. Over to you, Peter. All right, thank you. Um, well, I, I have many. I have thank yous as well to begin with, and 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 particularly to to Stephanie for um, inviting us to be here um, on behalf of the Nanaimo Lady Smith Public Schools. I, and I am coming to you, as as Lawrence said, from the University of Victoria, and so it's appropriate for me to acknowledge, with respect, the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory. The University Stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Sanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Like those of you who are in the Sunaimu, uh, Nanaimo area, um, and like, perhaps like many of our audience today, wherever you are, um, uh, where I am, uh, uh, in and around the Victoria area, we are treaty people. And I'm glad that we're able to make this connection today uh, around this shared history of these uh, uh, mid 19th century treaties and to talk about them um, and uh, what and to share our knowledge uh, of what we've learned by by researching them. I'm going to share my screen. I have a, a, some, a short presentation. It will take us through a bit the genesis of the book, and uh, I'll just go over the the principal um, uh, components of it uh, to show you. How, the, um, how it all came together and how each of our contributors um, adds to this discussion about the, uh, the treaties. So this book was published late last year. It's a collection of essays that brings together multiple perspectives on the treaty making that took place in the 1850s. And as it also addresses the question of the cessation of treaty making uh, and, and the absence of treaty making on the mainland colony of British Columbia after 1854. The uh, 14 treaties that we refer to as the uh, Vancouver Island treaties or the Douglas treaties are represented um, uh, on these maps, which appear in the book. Uh, in, in the book, they appear in black and white versions. So I'm delighted to be able to show you these col color versions uh, prepared by Ken Josephson which um, uh, are, are in, in, sort of more impressive uh, in, in this form. Um, the maps 
give us a sense uh, of the the kind of uh, of the, the regions, the areas of Vancouver Island uh, covered by these treaties, at least approximately, um, as they're described in the written texts preserved in the BC archives. Um, and it gives us a sense too of the rhythm of the treaty making process of the 1850s. So in the map on the, uh, on the right of the screen, you can see uh, uh, six treaties made in, in late April, 1850, covering uh, as, as far as we can tell from the written text anyway, areas of a few square miles uh, on different parts of what is now the greater Victoria area. But basically those six treaties collectively cover that, that, that urban area, what is now an urban area, up to uh, uh, Calls or Mount Douglas in the north and west. Uh, in the north and then west about to the present day uh, location of View Royal. And then shortly thereafter, you can see that also in the spring of 1850, there were another three treaties covering somewhat larger areas further west. Uh, those of us in the, in the region refer to these areas, this area today as uh, places like Machosan and Souk. Uh, the following year, February 1851, you can see two treaties uh, in northern Vancouver Island, the, uh, where the uh, Hudson's Bay Company had established a post named Fort Rupert following the discovery of potentially valuable coal deposits there. Then we have another 12-month interval before two other treaties uh, from February 1852, this time covering the Saanich Peninsula. And then Lastly, we have a treaty from December 1854. So again, uh, another period of uh, almost two years uh, following reportedly difficult negotiations about lands around what is present day Nanaimo where other coal deposits had aroused the interest of the Hudson's Bay Company. And the reason these treaties are significant is that um, they're certainly significant for people living in the area. But historically, in a sort of broader perspective, these were the only indigenous settler treaties negotiated within the bounds of what is now British Columbia until the late 20th century. Uh, and here I'm skipping over Treaty 8 from 1899, which covered parts of what is now Northeastern BC, but when, that was a treaty in which the province was not involved. Um, but effectively, you know, this is, a, this is a period of treaty making that begins and then ends, and there's a very long hiatus before it begins again. The, the written texts of these 14 treaties have a curious history in that they languished in the records of the colonial state, and then later the province. They were sort of categorized as land conveyances, and they were published, but otherwise uh, ignored by settler society. A BC Court of Appeal decision in 1964, however, upheld their status as treaties. And in the 50 years since that time, many observers have sought to understand this treaty making of 1850 to 1854, and in particular, the end of treaty making. There has been a definite aura of uncertainty surrounding this process. And on this question, uh, various writers have offered their views over the years. Um, and today, those views are scattered across uh, a number of books and monographs. One of the principal goals of our volume, To Share Not Surrender, is to uh, dispel some of those clouds of uncertainty. And we wanted to uh, collect, review, critique existing arguments and interpretations, bring additional research and insights to bear on the question, and ultimately to offer a more expansive understanding of this history of treaty making, and indeed the whole uh, broader range of dynamics of indigenous settler relations during this, this pivotal period. Like many edited collections, uh, To Share Not Surrender had its, has its origins in a conference. And I'd just like to spend a minute to talk a bit about that conference and the way it shaped the creation of the book. Um, the four originators of the, uh, the conference, the idea of a conference, um, some of them are pictured here. They include Graham Brazier, Hamer Foster, Neil Valence, and John Lutz, who is not in this photograph. Um, these are uh, folks who spent quite a bit of time um, uh, doing research in and about the era of the Douglas Treaties 
on a wide range of topics, including the treaties themselves. And uh, they were increasingly aware that much of this knowledge about the Douglas treaties uh, was scattered. Um, and indeed, not only across various uh, published works, but also in expert reports prepared in the context of litigation, for example. Uh, in other words, a kind of gray literature that was not readily uh, accessible to the general public. And so uh, the initial impetus for the conference was to bring together uh, uh, folks who had knew about the treaties uh, to share that knowledge and then ultimately to make this, this uh, more easily available through some kind of uh, publication, perhaps conference proceedings or something like that. But as the organization for this conference went, got underway, uh, the scope expanded considerably and particularly through uh, the collaboration with Songhees Nation. Uh, Chief Ron Sam, who's a little bit out of focus on the left in this uh, picture was instrumental in, in bringing um, uh, his some important resources to bear on the whole the organization of this conference. Um, and so uh, going into the conference, we had an expanded conference committee, um, which um, included a um, number of folks that you'll see in the uh, um, uh, photographs coming up, but including uh, representatives from Songhees Nation, including John Rice Jr. Um, and Cheryl Bryce. And so the conference became a bit larger as, as a result and members of the uh, Vancouver Island Treaty Association joined us as well as, as audience, uh, as part of the audience. And so we ended up with a conference that was not just um, a group of uh, sort of scholars uh, um, um, from, from, uh, from academia, but rather uh, a, 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 a much more diverse uh, uh, series of speakers uh, and participants and an audience that was, as far as we can kind of tell, roughly split, split um, uh, 300 people in attendance, but roughly split e equally between um, uh, indigenous folks and, and folks of settler descent. So um, uh, I'll just show a few photographs that show a bit about, that illustrate a bit how this conference unfolded. Um, we have uh, here, this is a, a organizer John Lutz on the right and Chief Ron Sams, but very importantly, um, Elder uh, Solchel uh, John Elliott Sr., who is um, who was one of two uh, uh, elders who provided uh, first, uh, for the first time ever, uh, uh, indigenous language versions of the written texts of the Douglas treaties uh, that are, and these are available. These are part of the, the book. Um, here we have uh, witnesses who, um, uh, following uh, uh, tradition, were called upon to witness the ceremony. Um, Maxine Matelpe at the uh, top left, uh, uh, moving clockwise, Robert Clifford, um, Stephen Hume, and uh, Doug White. Um, uh, Songhees Nation uh, began the open, the uh, uh, um, proceedings for us uh, with drumming. And we also had the um, uh, um, presentation of these translated versions of the treaties. So here in the front row, you can see uh, again, Chief Ron Sam on the left. In the middle, uh, Dr. Elmer George bearing the uh, Lekwungen version of the treaties. And on his right is uh, Councillor, uh, Songhees Councillor Gary Albany. Uh, just behind them, the next row, you can see John on the left, John Rice Jr., who was on our organizing committee. You can see John Elliott Sr., and he's bearing as well the Sinchothan language uh, version that he prepared, and Dr. Nick, Nick Claxton, um, uh, who's also a member of the organizing committee. Um, those written versions then were presented uh, formally to the uh, Royal, Royal BC Museum. There were two representatives on hand to receive them. Um, and um, uh, the Kwak Yudel Nation was also represented at this conference. Um, uh, they provided, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, there were presentations in particular on the bottom left, you can see hereditary chief, uh, sorry, bottom right, hereditary chief, Tony Hunt, and they also drummed and sang. Uh, and this is just a view of the conference proceedings underway a uh, fairly large group assembled. And one of the great things about the three-day conference was that um, 
uh, over the three days we were encouraged to, um, folks were encouraged to switch around, change their seating at the table. So, so every day you sat or morning and afternoon, folks sat with different, uh, different collection of people at their table. So we got to meet each other. All right, I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the contents then of the book. Um, and uh, uh, we had, uh, after the conference was held, we, we were thinking about ways of, you know, how can we take this, take the experience of the conference and the knowledge of the conference and share it more widely. And um, one of the things we realized was that um, a, a, what made the conference particularly special in our eyes uh, was also something that would be very difficult to translate or capture in a conventional uh, form such as, as, as print. Um, in particular, the, the, the ceremony, uh, which was uh, on, uh, evident uh, at the conference, does not, uh, could not easily be rendered. Um, and so we chose that initially, at least, we decided that we would focus on um, uh, written contributions that could be shared in this kind of uh, traditional format. Um, and so we, we asked uh, for people who presented at the conference to share um, uh, or to offer their uh, uh, more formal written version of their comments. And we collected those and we, we decided that among those uh, offered, we would focus very specifically on this, this, this period of treaty making, the kind of historical perspective here. Um, and so those other elements though of the conference, uh, which aren't well, particularly well represented in the book though, uh, there is a place for you to get a sense of those. And one of them is at the, the, the website for the conference, which is still online. Um, uh, and uh, also an upcoming, uh, a forthcoming publication, which will be uh, in collaboration with UBC Press in their Raven space. Um, uh, platform, which uh, where um, if those of you who may have attended the uh, talk with Elsie Paul, uh, her book has a Raven Space um, uh, is presented. In, there's a version of it available on Raven Space, which includes recording and audio. And so uh, we're looking forward to having uh, that up eventually as well. But for this today, we'll just be talking about the book and its uh, and these written contributions. And they are divided into four parts. You can see, uh, uh, in the, we're looking at the table of contents here. The first part looks at the kind of background or context to treaty making. Then there are uh, three papers focused on the treaties themselves. Um, and then finally in part, or rather in part three, a pair of essays that examines the, 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 the process uh, in, in detail. And then finally, in part four, papers that carry the story, uh, the sort of post-1854 story onto the mainland colony of British Columbia, where uh, a process of reserve creation emerged that uh, in, in some sense seems to have uh, replaced treaty making. Um, uh, so uh, briefly, um, in the first part, we have an essay by Adele Perry, which it, it explores the imperial worlds through which James Douglas moved, James Douglas being the chief factor of the Hudson's Bay Company at Fort Victoria and later governors of the Vancouver, governor of both the Vancouver Island Colony and the colony of British Columbia. And he was responsible therefore for treaty making and land policy. And so to understand, Doug, and to understand this history then in, in part involves understanding Douglas himself and he looms very large in this story. Uh, his is the only name that appears on all 14 treaties. And he has, a very, of course, a very interesting history of being born in Guyana to a Scottish father and a Creole mother, his apprenticeship in the North American fur trade, his marriage to a Cree woman, and eventually a kind of a social ascent within uh, uh, the British uh, world to a, a governorship and a, and, a, and a knighthood. He moved through a range of cultural and social worlds, but all of which and this is where uh, Perry's emphasis is, these were all shaped in many ways, these different worlds he moved in were shaped by empire. Um, he was a complicated person in Perry's estimation. Uh, one of her uh, conclusions is that he shows in his writings a range of often conflicting ideas about indigenous peoples and where he, th he thought they might fit in the imperial world that he did so much to create. His words were steeped in 
mid 19th century British racial knowledge. And he did locate indigenous peoples as being distinct and in some ways lesser than um, Europeans. So Perry wants to emphasize that he did not escape the, the race, racial and colonial logics of his day. At the same time, he was also had love for his Cree wife. He had a commitment to his family and he had a long history of success in the fur trade, which was predicated on uh, mutually, some kind of mutually beneficial relationship with indigenous peoples. So it leaves us with a sense of Columbus, uh, of, of rather uh, um, uh, Douglas as a complex figure. Uh, Laura Spitz's piece, which follows, is a foray into the worldviews of 19th century Europeans on the one hand and Coast Salish peoples on the other, looking at different cultural understandings of a fundamental question, what is a human being? Uh, for Europeans, and, and she focuses in particular on, on, on Douglas, again, Douglas's conception of what it meant to be human was deeply informed by the ideolo ideology of liberalism, so important in his day. Um, uh, and in one component of that was uh, of the liberal conception of the human being was their capacity to have property rights and exercise them. Um, and Douglas certainly saw indigenous peoples as humans in that sense. But uh, Spitz also notes that there were, in, in European discourse of the day, there were many dehumanizing elements. Um, and particularly what's interesting is that this era of treaty making that Douglas engages in also is co it coincides in the British imperial world with the emergence of uh, a legal category of Indian, um, which becomes a, a legal status within parts of the British Empire. Um, and so um, uh, again, Spitz complicates understandings and she uh, also brings to bear then um, uh, uh, draws upon uh, Coast Salish understandings of humanity to show that uh, from an indigenous perspective, treaty making um, had a, a very different conception of what it meant to be human. Uh, in, to some degree, uh, one way to, to sum up Spitz's argument is that for Douglas, being human meant that one had uh, rights, uh, whereas for many Coast Salish peoples, being human meant that one had obligations. Um, and, uh, and this is something that Douglas probably did not perceive. In the third chapter, Hamer Foster sets out to answer the question, what was the law of indigenous title at the time that the Douglas treaties were negotiated. Uh, one of the sort of confusing or curious aspects of the Douglas treaty process is that Douglas sort of set out on the process without having any particularly clear directives as Graham Brazier discusses in his chapter, clear directives of what he was supposed to be doing in, with regard to treaty making. Um, but in a broader question, what, what kind of law existed in the British imperial world? Uh, and Foster answers that there was in fact an emerging law that recognized indigenous title. It wasn't generated at, in sort of high level statutes or policy documents, but it was generated by common law courts. Uh, and it can, traces of it can be found through in imperial legislation, in criminal cases, and in legal opinions from government lawyers, as well as from lawyers acting for First Nations. In essence, he argues that there was this law, but um, it was kind of hidden and, 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 and secreted in the interstices of a whole bunch of different legal uh, contexts. Again, this emphasis on complexity. In part two, uh, Neil Valence introduces us to the first, the earliest First Nations accounts of the formation of the Vancouver Island Treaties. And I will skip over that because Neil will be talking about that shortly. But Neil also writes an introduction to chapter five, which are the Sinchothan and Lenkwungan texts of the Vancouver Island Treaties prepared by uh, John Elliott Sr. and Elmer George. Um, chapter six is a, a great example of um, community in, in engaged research. Uh, and it allows us to get a, to capture a sense of the, the rich, richness and sophistication of, in, in this case specifically, Huayat, uh, governance and laws regarding land. Uh, there's a foreword to this paper by uh, an Mchayak Robert Dennis Sr. of Hawaii First Nation, outlining the meaning of the modern of modern treaties 
to his nation. And then the bulk of the chapter is by Kevin Neary, who examines an episode of, uh, from, 19, eight, from sorry, 1859, uh, negotiations between a Hawaiian chief, Kleshen, and William Banfield. So this is a, a, a negotiation surrounding land. It's not, a, not one of the Douglas treaties, but it's important in this context because uh, the, the article reveals to us a Hawaiian sense of history, of governance, concepts of ownership that make possible a deeply contextualized reading of this uh, brief written document, a, a tr this so-called land transaction that is preserved in the BC archives. And what we have is that, you know, we have the Banfield, William Banfield coming away from this transaction, feeling that he had been uh, uh, received an outright transfer of a small island in Barclay Sound. But under Hawaiian law, Neary demonstrates that this was really merely a temporary assignment of rights to use and occupy the land. And that's an important context to keep in mind when we think about what might have happened uh, during the face-to-face uh, -face negotiations of the Vancouver Island Treaties. Um, in part three, uh, we have a pair of chapters which look very closely at the beginning and end of treaty making. Graham Brazier looks at the beginning. He examines this little backdrop to up to the point where Douglas began signing treaties. Um, Brazier emphasizes that Douglas had sympathy with indigenous peoples. He was concerned for their well-being in the, in the, in the uh, colony. Um, and his fur trade, but, but also notes that his fur trade background made it difficult for him to embrace the notion or at least fully embrace the notion of Aboriginal title. Um, in many ways, Brazier argues that for Douglas, land policy and treaty making was a kind of afterthought. Um, uh, it wasn't a, a major uh, priority for him. Um, and, and that explains, may explain in part why Douglas ceased making treaties because the process became difficult. Um, John Lutz uh, builds on this, uh, somewhat taking a different view. He emphasizes that uh, whether or not, it, maybe Douglas hadn't, didn't begin with treat, treaties as a priority, but certainly through the process, Douglas seems to have uh, come to the conclusion that treaties were important. And um, uh, Lutz, John Lutz uh, points out that his, Douglas and his successor in office, as well as the settlers represented in the Legislative Assembly, the Colonial Office in London, uh, colonial newspapers such as the British Colonist uh, or in Victoria, uh, and First Nations on Vancouver Island all wanted treaties through the 1850s and into the 1860s. So why then did Douglas stop making treaties in 1854? Well, Lutz's answer is that uh, there was essentially a political impasse that emerged uh, at among settler society, in settler society and in settler institutions. Um, after 1859, the Hudson's Bay Company and the uh, imperial government simply couldn't agree on a, a range of issues related to compensation for uh, land. Um, and so in a sense, even though many uh, actors wanted treaties, there was uh, a politi uh, uh, an impasse at the level of political institutions that kind of paralyzed and essentially terminated the treaty process. So the final two essays shift the focus from Vancouver Island and bring us to the colony of British Columbia. Sarah Pike proposes a new approach to understanding Douglas's reserve policy there. She examines the rules that Douglas devised to meet settler demands for land while preserving, at least Douglas wanted to preserve, indigenous interests as well. The focal point of these rules that Douglas uh, developed was this idea of preemption which was modeled on a practice used in Oregon uh, to the south. And this was a region Douglas was familiar with from his 20 years stationed at Fort Vancouver on the North shore of the Columbia River. Preemption allowed British subjects to acquire unsurveyed land without paying for it prior to occupying it. But through this system, Douglas also, according to Pike, wanted to preserve for indigenous peoples lands they occupied before settlers claim came. In Pike's estimation, Douglas did not really stop making treaties so much as he intended to pause the process temporarily while awaiting a resolution to this political impasse that Lutz describes. Douglas, she argues, was convinced that preemption was a practical solution to the problem of settler demand. He, but she also emphasizes that he understood that treaty making was also the principled solution. It's just that 
he didn't see a way of making it uh, continue. She, Pike sees Douglas as committed to what he called the civil and agrarian rights of First Nations. And those terms sound very strange to us, but essentially they recognize uh, a, a concept of political and also land rights. What Douglas did not foresee, of course, was that his temporary solution would in fact become the permanent one. In other words, preemption would continue in British Columbia until 1970, whereas treaty, makings, far, treaty making far from being put on pause was effectively white, uh, shunted aside by settler, by the colonial state um, um, after 1854. And the final essay by uh, Keith Carlson invites a different perspective on James Douglas. Uh, Carlson uses a major gathering of First Nations hosted by Douglas just before he retired in 1864 as a way to introduce his an analysis of the ways Douglas combined this commitment to an emerging liberal and Christian order, very ethnocentric, but also his commitment to preserving an in place, uh, a place for indigenous people in that new order. With all its faults, and definitely was a faulted vision, for all its faults, it was nonetheless, and this is, these are Carlson's words, something that indigenous people then regarded as workable and preferable to what replaced it in the years following Douglas's retirement. But Douglas's particular vision caused significant anxiety among the needs to the needs, uh, uh, sorry, increasing anxiety among uh, settlers who regarded him as too sympathetic to the needs and interests of the colony's first peoples. So that's a brief overview of the book um, and its contents. And I'd like to turn things over to Neil now uh, for uh, uh, greater attention to um, uh, 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 aspect that I hitherto hasn't discussed, which is of course, First Nations perspectives on those treaties. Okay, just bear with me while I uh, try and uh, do the share screen. Let's see, I think that's the one. Hopefully you're all seeing something called the earliest accounts of the Vancouver Islander Douglas treaties. Is that right? Yep. Okay, good, good stuff. Okay, <laughs> uh, overcame a problem that uh, uh, created a, an embarrassing four minutes uh, for me in my last presentation while I fumbled uh, all over the screen, not having my normal tech assistant, who is my long-suffering wife, Donna, uh, on that occasion. Anyway, uh, yes, here we are. Um, so being elderly as I am and becoming somewhat forgetful, I'm going to pretty much follow my, my notes, which uh, uh, will increase coherency and also prevent me from wandering off topic. So uh, let's we'll see how it goes. Um, first of all, a little personal background. Uh, my maternal and paternal uh, grandparents uh, uh, came to uh, Vancouver Island around 1910. There, uh, all of them were of mixed Scottish, Irish, and English heritage. Incredibly boring, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but there you go. Can't all have interesting backgrounds. Um, now, my first career uh, was as a, a, a lawyer in Victoria practicing in property law, which uh, sounds impressive perhaps, but it really meant that I dealt mainly with house purchases and sales and mortgages and helping people draft their wills and start up their small businesses. I did not practice Aboriginal law. Uh, I wish uh, I had, but I, I didn't. Uh, so uh, whereas Doug White, of course, uh, does practice Aboriginal law and uh, will be the person that, that you would go to for help in that regard. Anyway, around the year 2000, uh, I had a great uh, good fortune befall me. Uh, I was pretty tired of being a, uh, a solicitor and uh, was ready for a change. And a friend offered me the opportunity uh, to become a contract uh, researcher preparing ethno-historical reports on First Nation uh, land claims. Uh, specific claims, as they were called then, to do mainly with uh, reserves. And uh, my very first assignment was to uh, review the history of the 
Sinemach, uh, Nanaimo Treaty of 1854. Uh, the Sinemach people had filed a claim uh, that their uh, rights under the uh, Douglas Treaty uh, had not been fulfilled by the federal, uh, the federal, or the imperial, federal, or provincial crown. Uh, and I immediately became fascinated. I had never heard of the, the, the so-called Douglas Treaties before then. Um, I quickly decided that I didn't like uh, calling them the Douglas Treaties because they gave that gave undue emphasis to only to one side of the agreement and uh, ignored the fact that it's a, an agreement with uh, two parties, and that is the First Nations as well as uh, Douglas on behalf of the Hudson's Bay Company on behalf of. Uh, of Britain. Um, and as I did research on it, uh, I, on these claims, I became aware of uh, some uh, early First Nation accounts uh, of the treaty meetings, and they utterly fascinated me, and they were very powerful, um, but they were not, uh, at that point, has not been included in any uh, uh, research uh, reports on, on claims uh, so that uh, I realized that uh, I needed to, uh, felt a very strong uh, urge that I needed to collect these uh, accounts and uh, research them and critique them and uh, hopefully make them available uh, again. These uh, accounts had been made in the early 20th century uh, by elderly First Nations people who were desperate to get their point of view across to the settler society. Uh, and these efforts, though, were completely ignored. Uh, and so that I really felt my mission uh, was to, to gather them together and to present them back again to the settler uh, population, this time uh, with the hope that they would be prepared to listen. Anyway, that's what got me into the PhD program up at UVic in 2010, uh, where it was sort of started out with every anything anybody could ever want to know about these treaties, but it, it sort of gradually narrowed down to the uh, deceptively simple question of, well, what were the terms of the treaties? Uh, that uh, took me 365 scintillating pages to, uh, to answer. Um, and... I think that uh, there are basically two kinds of accounts. Uh, there are the set of the colonial accounts of what happened and the First Nation accounts. And today I'd like to try and uh, do two things. One is to unsettle or problematize the colonial accounts of the uh, treaties and what they mean, and to foreground the merits of the uh, subsequent First Nation accounts of what happened uh, at these treaty meetings and what was the outcome of, of these meetings. So that at the end, I hope you will be in a position to make up your own mind as to the relative merits of the two sets of narratives uh, that attempt to define what uh, the, the true nature of the treaties are. So first, a little bit of background on the uh, colonial account. In order to cement its sovereignty north of the 49th parallel and to thwart any American expansionist ambitions, Britain created the colony of Vancouver Island in 1849. Now, rather than go to the trouble of setting up a typical formal colonial establishment and sending out a bureaucracy to administer it, Britain came up with a novel idea of granting title to the entire island to the Hudson's Bay Company for a period of 10 years, during which the company was supposed to encourage colonization, thus reinforcing Britain's claim to the idea. So a pretty clever, low-cost way of uh, uh, achieving an imperial ambition. So the Hudson's Bay Company was given jurisdiction over the survey and sale of land uh, to anticipated settlers. And this task was delegated by the head, the Hudson's Bay Company uh, at its headquarters in London to its man on the spot, chief factor, James Douglas. Now the 1849 grant can be seen as a kind of land sale on a giant scale, leading to subsequent subgrants or sales to colonists once they started to arrive. 
However, before the progress began, Douglas was instructed by his superiors in London to remove any possibility that the local First Nations might assert any residual claims to the land. This was deemed advisable, not so much as a legal necessity, but as a precautionary measure uh, to make sure that nothing interfered with the process of settling, selling land to settlers who would want to be assured that any potential Indian land claims had been cleared away. So to achieve this, uh, Douglas called a series of meetings in 1850 with the leaders of several First Nations in the Victoria area with the goal of buying up their entire territory in exchange for some blankets and a promise to set aside their village sites and to allow them to continue hunting and fishing as long as it did not interfere with the needs of white settlers. Now, Douglas could not speak the local Lekwungen or Halkamalem languages, and the First Nations could not speak English. And neither had any understanding of the laws of the other concerning the occupation and use of land. In spite of that, Douglas reported to his bosses in London that he had succeeded in his assigned task. How did he manage that? Um, the short answer is that his report to London did not actually reflect the terms agreed upon orally at the treaty meetings. That's a pretty strong assertion for me to make, but I think I have the evidence to back it up. Peter, I'm just gonna confirm, is your PowerPoint needing to move forward? Oh, yes, there it is. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so uh, although the first one lasts quite a while, <laughs> but it's a good question to ask. Um, so that uh, anyway, that is the second one is uh, a view of uh, Fort Victoria as it was in the 1840s, and then across the harbor to the Songhees village, those series of longhouses there. So that just paints a, a lovely picture of where these meetings took place in 1850. So the uh, First Nations would have arrived uh, at the meeting place, unaware of Douglas's corporate agenda, but undoubtedly with an agenda of their own, although its contents are not known. No minutes of the treaty meetings were kept. None of the words spoke by Douglas or the First Nation representatives or his interpreter were recorded. So the, the interpreter was an amazing fellow called Tomo Antoine. He was a gifted linguist and uh, understood English and Halkamalem and uh, Lekwungen. Uh, and he must have faced a, a daunting task on the one, hand, one hand, uh, conveying the intent of his master, James Douglas, as to what uh, was transpiring uh, to First Nations, and then in turn, translating back to Douglas, uh, what, uh, what was said by the First Nations in response. And uh, that it's amazing that there was any sort of agreement at all reached given the, the cultural and linguistic gap between the parties, but I think there was an agreement. And uh, that uh, will become more clear as I deal with the First Nation accounts. So that the, um, just a bit of background here, that the treaty meeting making process, of course, had been underway for a considerable period of time in what is now Canada. Uh, starting geographically and chronologically in the Atlantic provinces with uh, some treaties there in the 18th century, which were uh, typically called peace and uh, goodwill treaties, but modern research uh, has indicated that they were actually about land and who had the right to occupy the land. Then later in the 18th century into the 20th or 19th century, there were a series of treaties uh, in on what is now Ontario. And uh, they started to involve uh, sessions of land on the part of the, the First Nations. And then uh, third period in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, the so-called numbered treaties moved from Ontario across the Prairie Provinces and up into the North. And those were categorized by the, the government of Canada as session treaties and uh, uh, purported to extinguish the uh, 
First Nation interest to all of their territories, not just parts of their territory, but ceding everything. And then you can see the exceptions were Quebec uh, and British Columbia that uh, did not uh, get involved in this particular treaty process. And we've seen this map before. So, This uh, document here is what we're going to talk about next. Um, this is uh, at the end of the, the meetings that Douglas had in 1850 with First Nation representatives. Uh, he wrote a letter back to his superiors in London uh, in May of, of that year, shortly after the meetings, a uh, long reporting letter. And in the last paragraph of his letter, uh, he made a surprising disclosure, quote, I attached the signature of the native chiefs and others who subscribed the deed of purchase to a blank sheet on which will be copied the contract or deed of conveyance as soon as we receive a proper form, which I beg may be sent out by return of post, unquote. So just to be clear, the treaty document at this point consisted of a list of names uh, with X's beside each name, space was left above the list for the addition of text at a later date. That's all there was taken away from the treaty meetings by way of a written document. Now, Douglas wrote this letter uh, to the superiors in London. They, they uh, hunted around and uh, came up with a template and that it was largely based um, I guess I cut that out. Um, it was largely based on a precedent used in a New Zealand land transaction in 1848 between the Naitahu Maori people and the New Zealand company on behalf of the British Crown. Uh, this New Zealand connection is Completely fascinating, but I don't have time today to say more about it, other than really it was written in the Maori language, and it really represents the first draft of the Vancouver Island Treaty template, uh, which was uh, basically sent by the New Zealand governor to London. It was published by Parliament. Hudson's Bay Company official there saw it and thought, aha, this is great. What worked in New Zealand has got to work uh, on the west coast of uh, North America. Uh, and so that uh, he went ahead and uh, uh, sent off this template, made some changes to, to it, but not too many. Um, and Douglas, when he received it, he filled in the uh, template with a template with the name of the relevant tribe or family, a description of the boundaries, the price paid. The final step in this unique process was for Douglas to copy the completed texts of the treaties onto the spaces left for that purpose at the top of each sheet of paper above the list of names. So you can see there's that same list of names, uh, but now it has this template filled in and added to it after the fact, many months after the meetings, because obviously uh, postal uh, mail to England took three months to go to England and three months to come back again. So that uh, the letter that enclosed the template uh, from the Hudson's Bay Company said, this is a form of agreement for purchase of land from the natives of the poor uh, from natives of Vancouver Island, a copy with hardly any alterations to the agreement adopted by the New Zealand Company and their transactions of a similar kind with the natives there. So that it is likely that Douglas did not take templates to subsequent uh, treaty meetings, but continued his practice of adding the text later in his office after he had completed the list of names. He did not then show the completed forms to the First Nation parties. Instead, he squirreled them away in the land's office to be produced, produced upon request uh, to potential colonists wanting to be reassured that the Indian land question had been dealt with. Um, so these things were meant largely uh, hidden away. They did not uh, 
become published until 1875, when a compendium of correspondence and copies of these were published. Uh, and so there you can see that is an example, the first one. It's all of two paragraphs long. And basically the wording uh, supposedly says that the, you know, the chiefs and people of the Tichamitsa tribe, one of the Songhees First Nations, um, have uh, made our marks to this deed and uh, do consent to surrender entirely and forever to James Douglas, the agent of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, and then describes the land that was included on the condition that our village sites and closed fields are to be kept for our, our own use, for the use of our children, for those who may have to follow after us, and the land shall be properly surveyed hereafter. It is understood, however, that the land itself, with these small exceptions, becomes the entire property of the white people forever. I'm trying to imagine Tomo Antoine, the interpreter, trying to get that message across and uh, whether that's how he phrased it. I highly doubt it uh, that he would have put it in this manner uh, and that they would have agreed to it if that's how it was phrased. Uh, and then as all of understand that uh, we are at liberty to hunt over the unoccupied lands, that is to say, so long as they remain unoccupied by whites, uh, and it's also understand that we are liberty, or sorry, have been to carry on our fisheries as formerly. And there's been much uh, litigation over what that meant, um, but largely, um, I think it was intended that they would be allowed to continue their, their native fishery in competition with white fisheries. Now, tucked away in the archival records are examples of First Nation spokespeople attempting to explain their understanding of the treaties to non-First Nation audiences. Unfortunately, at the time they spoke, the intended audience was unable to listen and their message was ignored. There are five such accounts that have been reduced to writing over time. The accounts are mostly secondhand and all produced long after the events described. With one exception, they were told to journalists and published in newspapers. As a result, they have received little attention from scholars or the courts. However, they represent the earliest extant First Nation accounts of what transpired. Therefore, they cannot be discarded out of hand, and every effort has to be made to identify the insights they are capable of providing. For reasons of time, I can present only excerpts from the accounts of Sinemuk Elder Dick Wolcombe and Sandwich Chief David Latasse. Now, the slide here is the Sinemuk Village, uh, which is in the site of the present day parking lot of the Harbor Park Shopping Center, if you want to locate it. Um, so that, uh, now the account of the 1854 Nanaimo Treaty, the last one, uh, by Sinemuk Elder Dick Wolcombe is contained in the transcript of his testimony before the McKenna McBride Commission on Indian Affairs in British Columbia in 1913. Wolcombe testified at a commission meeting that he was 83 years old, which meant that he was 24 when the treaty was concluded. His name is among the 159 names uh, listed on the written version of the Nanaimo Treaty, and his account is the only one by a First Nation sig signatory to a Vancouver Island Treaty. It's incredibly important. So welcome, speaking through a translator, recalled his meeting with, with Douglas. Uh, and the first part I'll read from my notes, and then there's a second part on the screen. So welcome, speaking through a translator, recalled his meeting with James Douglas. I want to tell you people, I was amongst the first people who found coal in Nanaimo. Two months later, Sir James Douglas himself came over to see where the coal was. Sir James Douglas said, I will buy this coal. But he also said, I will not buy anything but the coal. All the wood and land is yours. The land where the coal is, is yours. And the land up the river, the Nanaimo River, is yours. The promise that Sir James Douglas made with us is being broken. We are being pushed off our land. They are now stopping the Indians from cutting the wood and from taking the fish. After that statement, Wolcombe was cross-examined under oath by the commissioners. Commissioner McKenna, what do your people want today? Welcome. What we want is to get the land back or to get some settlement. And there we are to this very day. 
where the Sanima people want to get their land back or to get some settlement. So this was an issue right from the very beginning. McKenna, you say that you and some other Indians brought down spurs to Victoria and also coal. Before that time, were there no white men here? Welcome. No, there were no white men before that. McKenna, then afterwards, Sir James Douglas came out. Oh, yes. McKenna, and you made treaty with Sir James. Answer, yes. He said, quote, the land is yours, unquote. So a fairly strong, a very strong uh, point of view expressed then by him. Wolcombe was clear that Douglas asked only for permission to take the coal, not their land. According to Wolcombe, Douglas had promised that the Sanema could keep their land and would continue to harvest the resources of the land and ocean without interference. The statement is important because it directly addresses the issue of the terms of the treaty with the First Nation version provided by an eyewitness under oath. Wolcombe acknowledged the fact of a treaty to arrange for the sale of coal, but steadfastly denied that it was intended to authorize the indiscriminate occupation of their land by whites. Now this slide shows Sir James Douglas in his uh, gubernatorial finery, and on the right, uh, the uh, ceremonial uh, garb of Chief David Latas, uh, Spanish. His account was in 1934. Uh, he claimed at that time to be 105 years old and an eyewitness to the 1852 Spanish Treaty meetings. The archival record does not support his claim, thus his account is likely secondhand. Nevertheless, his important contribution to the search for the oral terms of the Vancouver Island treaties is a lifetime spent listening and talking with knowledgeable people knowledgeable about the treaties, absorbing information from many sources along the way, and expressing his views as they evolved over the years. In other words, rather than an eyewitness, he was the first student of the Vancouver Island treaties. Now, time is running on, so I'm going to cut things short uh, and not uh, deal with uh, David Latassa's words. And really then just skip to the summary uh, that I came to after review of the five accounts uh, and that they uh, are remarkable in their continuity as to the, uh, their understanding of what uh, the First Nations came away from the meetings. Uh, the Vancouver Island treaties likely included the following terms compensation for land already occupied and resources previously harvested by non-First Nation residents, continuation of the terms of their existing joint occupation and enjoyment of land and resources, and agreement to negotiate expansion of non-First Nation establishments and activities provided it did not interfere with the existing way of life of the First Nations. In sum, the First Nations negotiated with James Douglas an agreement to share not surrender the land and its resources. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. I think it's over to, uh, to Doug White. Mm -hmm. right. See if I can stop sharing my screen there. Hey, thank you. Siam Nasiaya, ain't the pet Quilosalton Tani Slanemo, ain't the pet Cleishan Tani Hoopachasset. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug White uh, from the Snanemo First Nation here in the Nanaimo. I really want to thank my cousin Lawrence for his opening words and uh, opening prayer for us today. Thanks, Stephanie and the others uh, from the organizing committee, this, this particular speaker series, for the invitation to jump on to the important work and discussion presentation that Peter and Graham and Neil uh, have put, put together for today. Um, Stephanie and I, uh, we've known each other all through our lives. And so uh, we ran into each other and she said, we're doing a talk about the Douglas treaties. It's gonna be, you know, it's here in Nanaimo, it'd be good if you could share a few words. And so I'm very happy to do that. I'm honored to be asked to uh, speak with such a, esteemed scholars. Um, this is a, one of the most important stories in our province, in our country. Uh, the story of these particular treaties and uh, the progression and the, the arc that they've been on over the last hundred and whatever it is, 60, 70 years. It's truly amazing. Uh, the issues that uh, the Crown and Indigenous peoples were grappling with 
back then are the same issues we continue to grapple with today in BC. Even the economy, the very structure of the economy that BC continues to wish for, it hasn't changed. Can you imagine that? You know, the, the, there was a very good description from Peter at the beginning about the location of the treaties and why, why in these locations and you know, coal mining was the driving factor. The, the colony was desperate for an economic foundation for itself. It needed somewhere to settle and therefore the Victoria area treaties. And it needed some kind of an economy to sustain itself. And therefore, the uh, Kwakiwak uh, part of the world treaties, and then ultimately the Stanemo Treaty, the final one. Uh, but I, I've always, I, I was on a, a BC AFN economic development panel uh, maybe three or four years ago. And uh, one of the heads of the BC Mining Association, whose name escapes me right now, he, got, he was giving a talk and talking about how you know, in this moment of, uh, of, of the Chilcotin Nation decision and uh, about our Aboriginal title and this and that, we've never been here before. And it's going to be hard work to figure out how, how we sort out these issues in mining in this province uh, because we've never been there before. And I had to, I was the chair of that session. And so I had to correct them. And I said, in fact, we have been there before. Uh, back in the 1850s, the approach of the Crown was that, look, if we want to if there's a resource, a natural resource we want to extract in this province for economic purposes, uh, and we don't have a, an existing relationship with the indigenous peoples, then we need to do that first. We need to recognize that there's something called title and, and turn our minds to it and put some effort into it to figure out how do we get to a place of commonality with the indigenous peoples. And that was the story in Stanemo. We agreed that we would sell coal to James Douglas and his crew. Um, I've always found it to be an utterly ludicrous proposition that uh, we sold, my ancestors sold our territory to some characters that showed up on a boat uh, for a stack of blankets. That's the most ridiculous uh, proposition I've ever heard. Um, but, you know, we, we had a discussion. The, the, it's important for everyone to know that the actual substance of the treaty, the terms of the treaty, it's not in the text of the treaty um, alone. It's not in the oral history alone. It's in, you know, as a, as a matter of law, the clear approach is to try to determine what is the shared and common understanding between the parties about what they did. And can we do that? Um, so a remarkable history. I really appreciate the, the great scholarship of Peter and Graham and uh, Neil that they've done. Uh, when I was the, I, so I was the chief of Stanemo going back to 2009. And I had grown up in uh, a family. My, my, my father was a counselor, Doug White II. His father, Doug White I, was chief of Stanemo during the White and Bob litigation. It was his cousin, Clifford White, was the, um, was, was the accused there that had been convicted and et cetera. And the story that led to White and Bob and uh, David Bob from Stanawis was the other person. They were out hunting in the summer of 63 up in the southern slopes of Mount Benson and been uh, charged for hunting deer out of season. And so, I, you know, we know about these stories in our community. We've always known about the treaty relationship. Um, so it's in a very, as a matter of the history of the practice of law and access to access to justice matters for Indigenous peoples and all of this, we all know the story of the Indian Act prohibiting First Nations from hiring lawyers from 1927 to 51. Uh, but by the 60s, uh, you know, the, there was a great failure of the legal system for a Clifford and David when they were standing up uh, from the prisoner's box in downtown Nanaimo at the Nanaimo Courthouse in front of Magistrate Beaver Potts. And um, uh, the lawyers, they, I think they went through, I think there was two or three different lawyers that abandoned them that summer they were assigned and somehow they were supposed to be the lawyers lawyers well, you know what judge i'm asking permission to withdraw from this i can't get any meaningful instructions from these people and then there was this issue of is the indian agent going to come and speak from cowichan or is he going to come and talk and say does he have something to say about this because what happened on so they were hunting july 7th or yeah 7th July 8th, they were in front of the magistrate and their answer, he said, well, what do you guys say to this charge? 
Clifford stood up and said, my answer to this charge is that he called it a treaty of peace. There's a treaty of peace between our people that allows us to hunt in the way we were hunting. And so that was uh, him standing up based on his knowledge from his community, his family, his people about what permits him, what's the legal framework within which he goes hunting to feed his family and to feed his community. Um, by September, uh, Magistrate Beaver Potts had gotten tired of all of the, the delays. And um, they, he asked them then, so do you guys have something to say or not? Do you have evidence? Like, do you have anything to say for yourself? And they said, in fact, we do. And we want Joe Elliott from Cowichan, one of the, uh, one of the major Coast Salish historians. He was like a historian of the Coast Salish people. We want him to come and talk. And so he was the, the judge, after arguing about this, allowed him to come forward. And so uh, Joe Elliott stood up and he started, he had with him a photostat copy of the book that Neil showed us from 1875. And he started to read from it, right? I mean, that book is a, it's a papers connected with the Indian land question. And the whole opening segment of that book is a restatement of the texts of the Douglas treaties held down in the BC archives. So he started to read. It was, he was reading from the, this is what it says about the Stanemo. This is what the, it talks about their hunting rights. And the judge just shut him right down, shut it, turned it off and said, you know what? I'm going to stop you right there. Everyone in this province knows that there was never treaties made here. So I don't know what nonsense you're talking about. And that's it. I'm convicting you, Clifford. Um, and David, you're convicted. And he, and he fined them and they weren't able to pay the fines and Clifford White ended up in jail. But so when Tom Berger got involved, Maisie Hurley brought Tom Berger in. He was just, you see the pictures of Tom, he looks like a teenager. He's so young. And that great man, one of the great Canadian jurists in Canadian history, he just passed away last year, Tom Berger. But he was brought in for the first time to deal with and grapple with Indigenous issues. This was his introduction uh, to indigenous uh, conflict with the crown. I remember having coffee with him years ago, I sat down at his, he had an office at the Marine Building in Vancouver and we were having coffee downstairs. And I said, because what's remarkable when you read the uh, Court of Appeal decision by the time they got up there and, and, and the other decisions, I said, it's remarkable what you guys did in that case. How is it that you effectively argued everything that we've continued to argue all through the last half century. You know, because their, their first line of argument was that the document is a treaty. Because why? Because, you know, it's 1963. The Crown, for more than 100 years at that point, had denied the need for treaties. And part of that storyline, a political storyline of denial of the need for treaties or the recognition of Aboriginal title, was we better at the same time suppress the reality of the history of 1850 to 54 treaty making on Vancouver Island, because that's inconsistent with our political story that we're trying to continue to carry on with through the all through the, the early part of the 20th century through the 1963. Very powerful denial. And, um, and this is where the work of these scholars is so important. So well, okay, let me quickly say, so what, when, I, when I asked him, how did you come up with this? Because he argued, first and foremost, that there is a treaty. If that's rejected, then the second line of argument was, we're going to talk about the Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title of the Stanemo to do what they were doing. So you choose which one you want to grapple with. Ultimately, they won on the treaty, pro, on the treaty arguments, of course. But I said, where did that come from? How did you arrive from Vancouver you know, criminal defense lawyer in Vancouver doing random, like, where did all of this come from? How did you put all this forward? And he said, well, I came to Stanemo, I sat down with the elders, and they told me the story of these treaties. I'd never heard about it, a word about these before. Magistrate Beaver Potts, who'd practiced as a lawyer and sat on the bench, he'd never heard a word about these treaties before. And so, he went down to Victoria and went and dug around. He went and he, he got a hold of people like Willard Ireland, the provincial archivist, and Wilson Duff, the provincial anthropologist. And he went, you know, he found the documents that Neil is talking about, this, you know, this ledger of 
land conveyances that Douglas had, had stuffed away in, in whatever government office and ultimately ended up in the BC archives. He said, we need to get this in as evidence. And so notwithstanding that the elders have this story and an oral history about what this treaty is and what it means, we need to get the text of the document in. Because I don't think any Canadian judge is going to be listening to elders yammer about the oral history of this or that in the 1960s. So, but if there's a written document, then maybe somebody will listen to it. And so the way to get the document is, is have the provincial archivist bring it in as and submit it as evidence, put in as evidence. Was like, I think it was like exhibit number eight or something of the of the defense. And there it is, it's in. Now Remarkable to me that when I, you know, show, so they win, right? They go up to the BC, the Supreme Court of Canada by 1965 confirms the BC Court of Appeal decision and we and, and, and it up overturns and upends the whole crown narrative of the fact that there was never treaties and whatever these things were, they were not treaties. They were some kind of land purchase thing. Unbelievable that we had to do that, like a ba basic fact of history argument. And, um, so, you know, I, so I hear about all this history from my grandfather, from my father, my family, my community, cousins, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I go to law school to, you know, go to law school, learn about the rule of law and all these beautiful concepts and ideas, right? And the Quebec secession reference. You read what the Supreme Court of Canada says about what are the most cherished and fundamental legal values and principles that hold what we call Canada together. One of the pillars of that is the rule of law. And um, so you learn about all these beautiful things, right? And then, and then somehow I end up uh, becoming the chief of Slanemo in 2009. I sit down in that seat and I have never seen so clearly how powerfully the crown was continuing to deny all of that history. They were denying still that a treaty had been made in 1854 with my people. They were effectively denying that the Stanemo had gone to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1965 and had won recognition of those rights in that treaty. They were effectively denying that the Constitution in 1982 in Section 35 says what it said. Like the capacity for denial, stunning and shocking. And so when... When I was advocating as a chief of Stanemo to try to figure out how do we work to implement, like, what, what, you know, we're, we're like a large nation. We're well situated in an urban context, but oh my God, we're dirt poor, basically flat broke, none of our own money, nothing. The smallest, little, tiniest little Indian reserves that exist in this country. 267 hectares of land, most of which goes underwater every winter when the tide comes up and there's a big rain, a flood. You go compare that to a Soyuz who has 32,000 acres of reserve land, right? And four or 500 members. The Snenemo has suffered structural poverty, dispossession. And so when we sat down as a government, we said, look, we need to better have a quick talk here and when I showed up with my counsel and I said, I need advice, direction. We need to have a discussion how to get out of this mess because I am not here as the chief to administer poverty for my people. I'm not here to hand out band-aids. I need to know right now, how are we going to change and transform this basic reality? And when we looked at everything, you know, all we have is a, is a, is a pop stand and a chip stand. That's what our economic development was. You know, and, and then we would lease a little bit of land to the mill on the south end of the, I mean, holy man, what a mess. What a disgraceful situation. When we looked at the overall context, we knew that, and, and we looked at all the opportunities that lay in front of us. What possible tools do we have to wield to make a difference and to change that? We settled upon the Douglas Treaty rights as the most powerful legal rights as far as I'm concerned, that exist in this country, and at the same time, that are utterly and completely disrespected and unimplemented by either crown. Unbelievable, but nonetheless, very powerful tools. So we began to deploy them. As part of the deployment and implementation strategy, we realized that, you know what, there is a massive gap in general public knowledge about these treaties and what they mean. 
but part of the history of denial of the crown plays over and spills over into the academy and into the universities. What academic is going to research treaties that never happened, that didn't exist, that are not recognized by the crown? None. None did. By, even by the time I was chief, deep into the 21st century, I said to staff, gather up everything that's ever been written about this stuff. I want to see what it looks like. I want to know everything that anyone, everyone's ever written about the land rights under the treaties from Vancouver Island in the 1850s. I want to know what anyone's ever written about the fisheries rights, the hunting rights. I'm telling you, it was a very thin set of documents that Peter talked about. Lots of sort of this stuff that is obscure and hidden in litigation and et cetera. And so we, we said, we need to do that work. And so we, we held a conference in 2012 with Vancouver Island University on the treaties as part of that initiative. And John Lutz, who worked with these fellows, he reached out to me. We had, and one of the other things we did is we set up the now defunded Center for Pre-Confederation Treaties and Reconciliation at VIU to bring attention to, to you know, what, what the TRC said so powerfully about the education system in this country. They said much of what is wrong in this country, the responsibility for that rests at the feet of the education system of Canada, both for what it taught Canadians and for what it didn't teach Canadians, for the omissions, what was left out in people's general education that you would get as a Canadian. And so the the absolutely essential and important work of focusing attention and bringing attention to these things through the, con the 2012 conference. And then John Lutz reached out 2014 to talk to me about, you know, about doing a second conference. Unfortunately, my son, my beautiful boy, Willem, uh, ended up with cancer that year. And so I had to tell John, look, we can't co-host at the center in Nanaimo. I'm utterly, I'm not here anymore. I'm just dealing and focused on my boy and his health. And so John, you know, the, he pivoted to the wonderful Songhees people and all of the people that have been described. And um, this is such important work, the gathering up of people to talk. I know that it was, I was there, I, I went to the conference. I was called as a witness and I watched. And it was like two worlds slowly trying to figure each other out. The academics over here doing their academic, some of them were really kind of in their academic conferencing mode. And then the half the room was indigenous peoples from the treaty areas. And they were going, what are those people talking about? We don't know. Are they, are they speaking English? You know, we talk about Chinook and trying to translate between two worlds is like, what is going on? And it, it created, you know, tension or whatever. People stood up and talked. And that's fine, right? I mean, that's how it's going to be until we continue to talk and work through. And so this really, this important book, is it's such an important book because it gathers up and it states important understandings and the product of people, very, uh, the most highly educated people in our society, turning their sharp minds and lenses towards this issue to help all of us understand what happened in the 1850s and 1854 so that we can better today understand how are we meant to behave today so that we're not carrying on with the nonsense of the last 150 years, but that we're living up to what is the best version of who we can be together. There's no way that any people should ever be subject to having to litigate for basic rights in, in the way that Indigenous peoples have for so long now. So it's up to Canadians and British Columbians, people who live on Vancouver Island, to inform themselves about this and to help shape that different future. And with the work that these people have done, the Songhees people with them, the Kwakwakiwak-speaking peoples with them, uh, they're helping us, right? They're lifting us up. They're opening our eyes and they're shining light and they're, and they're creating the understanding that is the essential material that can lead towards meaningful reconciliation. Because we can't be reconciled if we don't understand each other. If we're not talking the same language, if we're not working together to have meaningful dialogues to help 
us understand who each other is and who collectively we should be together in a respectful relationship premised on recognition, respect, mutuality. So with that, I want to really thank uh, you for the opportunity um, uh, to share a few thoughts about this important work. Peter, Neil, Graham, Stephanie, Lawrence, and everyone that's here, and everyone that listens to this talk. This is such an important and essential knowledge to be shared. And so I'm grateful that people have put time and effort into this because we're backfilling a major omission from the last 150 years of our history together. We're creating a new uh, solid foundation upon which we can stand. So really thank you very much. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, I must uh, go, unfortunately, but uh, so I'll say my thank yous to everyone uh, and my gratitude uh, for this powerful talk we've had today. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I will have to take my leave and uh, become a grandfather for a few hours. So. <laughs> thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Over to you, Lawrence. My new really raising my hands to each and every one of you for sharing this important uh, body of work to help our people understand the history of what has been taking place in this area of the world. Uh, you know, I think about what I'm trying to learn, and that's prior to contact, trying to understand who I am as a Hwalmuch. And hearing what you guys are talking about and trying to absorb what is taking place. Uh, I have a lot of learning that I need to do. And I really thank you for helping me uh, understand who I am as a man, as a Coast Salish person. And how I can begin to understand more on how I can share this in a beautiful way and help shape the minds and the ideas and the imagination of today's youth. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, hearing you speak Colossalton mm -hmm. really takes me to a deeper place inside myself and wants me to become more than I already am. And I left that out in when I was talking about your biography and your history, that, you know, you're, you're a role model to me. And I thank you. And I always look forward to hearing you. And, you know, I'm trying to hold back the tears because what you speak so eloquently um, is everything that I want to be as a person. So I thank you for helping me become that. You know, I'm taking my baby steps and learning what it means to be a Coast Salish man, a father, a grandson, a cousin. Um, and I'm made more by just hearing you and being in your presence. Graham and Peter and Neil, we are truly honored that you guys were able to join us and share, share this meaningful work that has been taking place. And it's beautiful. I th we really raise our hands with our, our most acknowledge, acknowledgeable and grateful hearts that the work that you've conducted and continue to produce helping shape our country is beautiful. And we acknowledge all of your hard work and everything that you've had to endeavor into to bring this to the light and share this light with everybody that needs to hear it and understand it and absorb. So uh, we really thank the Nanaimo Lady Smith Public Schools and uh, everybody that is journeying with us. It's such an important body of work that we've we've listened to today, you know, uh, I really need to go through that book and begin to understand more in my own journey. And I encourage each and every one of you to uh, take a look at that website, trc57series.ca, and learn about everything that we are trying to bring forward for the, the people in this district. And worldwide, there have been people across the waters in Europe and down south that have been joining us in this journey. And it's a beautiful journey. And I really thank uh, School District 68 
for changing the narrative and including our people in the um, education of today's youth. Uh, it, is, it is a complete honor. Thanking each and every one of you for the work that you've done that got us to where we're at today. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Graham. Thank you all. If you'd like to watch some of these episodes, please reach out to the VIRL, the Vancouver Island Regional Library Facebook page, or go direct to the um, session's website at www.trc57speakerseries.ca. Thank you. Noah.